Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we're in one of the gunnery storerooms down on third deck. Uh, if you're looking at your booklet of general plans, this is uh, 32040. So it's just a storage space. This one has a, the largest hatch on the ship. It's basically right aft of the flight deck. There, there's a big hatch there that lowers stuff down here. And so the gunnery department stored some of their big heavy stuff in here. We're in the middle of restoring this space and we found this guy right here. This is a pretty cool tool and I couldn't tell you what the actual name for it is. Some sort of vertical lathe or something like that. Um, but the crew referred to it as the circumciser. So this, notice this drum here, 16 inches in diameter. This is for your 16 inch gun. Now, if you watch this older video we did, linked down below, uh, where we talked about how the 16 inch gun is a built up design, it's several different tubes and liners and sleeves all slotted together. The innermost sleeve is the one that has the rifling on it. It's a relatively thin sleeve. And the idea is that when you've worn out the rifling, as designed, you could shoot about 300 shots through it before the rifling wears out. Then you could pull that sleeve out and put another one in without having to make a whole new gun barrel. Gun barrels are extremely long lead items. So when a ship is authorized, they tend to make the gun barrels like right off the bat before they do anything else. Which is why the Iowa class battleships have so many gun barrels laying around because they kept making the barrels for Illinois, Kentucky, and some of the Montana class battleships. And then when those ships weren't completed, then all those gun barrels were just sitting in the inventory. So. Every 300 shots, you've got to replace the entire liner, which means removing the entire gun barrel from the ship. But every couple dozen shots, the force of a 16 inch shell pushing its way through that liner, and remember each shell has a brass base ring at the bottom that is designed to be worn uh, it, it expands to grip that liner and basically has the ridges of the rifling cut into it, or get cut into it as it's being pushed through it. And that's what causes the shell to grip the liner and spin. Well, while that's happening, all that pressure is starting to gradually flatten out that liner, which means it pops out the front of the muzzle. Why is this a problem? Because as that thin metal that makes up the liner starts to come out of the front of the gun, it is now no longer supported by the tube, which means as this projectile is coming through, it could cause a crack in that liner in the unsupported area. And then that crack will just run down the liner through the supported area. And there goes the accuracy of your guns. Accuracy is vitally important when you've got this analog computer and you're firing things over the horizon. Uh, a crack liner, you just can't hit the side of a barn. So what did they do in this circumstance? Turrets one and three can depress to negative two degrees elevation. Turret two can depress to zero degrees elevation. You depress these all the way. You insert this thing into the muzzle of the gun, and then you can basically trim off the excess skin from the liner that's starting to poke through the end of the muzzle. Like I said, the crew called it the circumciser. In fact, during the Vietnam War, when they had to trim it, they had the chaplains supervise it. The chaplain wasn't necessarily a rabbi, but because you've only got one or two chaplains administering the religious rites to the entire crew, it tends to be even Catholic or Protestants or whatever denomination will uh, supervise any sort of religious ceremonies like a circumcision. So the Iowas did have their gun barrels 
all swapped out in the 1950s. This is following the, uh, both World War II and Korea. They were getting close to 300 shots per barrel and they decided, you know what, if we get into another shooting war, we don't want to have to stop, take the ship out of service, swap out the barrels. So, you know, we're, we're 240, 250 shots per barrel already. Let's just uh, swap them out now. But then by Vietnam in the 1980s, they had additives that they added that prevented the rifling from being worn away. So it functionally increased the line of the, the it functionally increased the lining of the barrel to the entire lifespan of the ship. However, in 1984, they had to replace the center barrel of turret two. And they had to do it for exactly the reason I described. The, the lining of the barrel got cracked. Center barrel turret two was the one they always fired first during shore bombardment missions. Maybe because it's in the center, it's the central most one of the ship, so it's the firing solution is most accurate for that one. Uh, maybe it was just Captain Snyder's preference. But during the Vietnam War, turret two center barrel got way more use than any of the others. And so uh, in the 1980s, either in some of the gunnery training they did prior to their big deployment or during the uh, long deployment off Beirut, they found that that barrel had a crack in it and was completely inaccurate. So they stopped using it. Uh, they used the other eight barrels, but they stopped using that one until they were able to get back to Long Beach in 84. And then they pulled out that barrel and put in a whole new one. Uh, that barrel got cut up for scrap, but all of the ship's other barrels, as they got changed out, were staved in the inventory. The Navy still has some of these 16-inch barrels in the inventory, although they're gradually uh, getting them out and either scrapping them or working with museums to get them on display. Check out this video in the description below to see where Battleship New Jersey's nine World War II era gun barrels ended up. One of my favorite movies of all time is Under Siege. One of my favorite lines from Under Siege, when uh, Chief Casey Ryback, played by Steven Seagal, uh, who it turns out is a very problematic Putin-supporting individual, but did a good job with this movie. Um, he is talking to one of his friends on the ship after Tommy Lee Jones has taken over. Hope that didn't spoil too much. And the guy says, man, I don't know what I'm doing. I did laundry during the Gulf War. We forget that life on the ship is not constant fighting. There's a lot of other stuff going on. When you join the Navy, you might uh, be doing sewing or working in the galley or the ship's laundry or doing any of these mundane tasks. Let us know in the comment section down below what you think the weirdest job that people in the military end up doing is. Circumcising a 16-inch gun is certainly up there on my list. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals. We really appreciate your support. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to donate to keep helping us restore spaces like this gunnery storeroom. It allows us to find missing parts of the ship that we didn't even know we had. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about our channel and our museum. Thanks for watching.